Over in a preview of my application here, I can register a brand new account. And once I do that, it's going to sign me up in my database and then redirect me through to a settings page where I can make changes to my account. Then as you'll see on our settings page, we have the ability to upload our own profile photo as well as any other additional images we'd like to display on our profile. We can then also scroll down and update things like our bio, our job title, as well as our location. And if I was to open up the settings tab here, I can also change things like my age, my gender, as well as my sexual interests. And I can also update my age preference on this slider here. Once I choose to update these changes here, what you'll see is that we'll have an alert message at the top of our page just to notify us that those changes have been made in our database. Then over on our home page, I'm going to be shown a list of users that I can start swiping through. And of course, these users are going to be displayed based on the preferences I've added within my settings page. If I wanted to dislike a user, I could swipe left on them. If I even wanted to view the additional images on a user's profile, I can select my information icon here. And what you'll now see is I can swipe through a list of this user's additional photos. And let's say I'd like to match with this user. I can swipe right on them. And if they've also swiped right on me, what you'll see is that it's going to create a new match within our application in which if I wanted, I could choose to send this user a message here. And then over on my dedicated match page, I can see a list of all of the people that I've matched with in our platform, as well as those who I have a current chat going with. And if I was to click on this chat, it's going to redirect me through to a dedicated page where I can send and receive messages with this particular user. And as you'll see, it will store and display a full list of messages that I exchanged within this chat. Hello, my name is Lachlan Kirkwood, and today I'm going to be teaching you how you can build your own dating application like Tinder without writing a single line of code in Bubble. Back in 2021, I'd released my very first version of my Tinder clone tutorial, but since then Bubble has updated the way in which you can build responsive applications with the Flexbox responsive engine. So I just wanted to take the time to completely rebuild this app from the ground up just so that way you can create a fully responsive application across any device size, which is just going to create a much better experience for your end users. It's beautiful. While I was rebuilding this app, I also took the time to add in some additional optimizations to the way in which I had structured the overall build. So what you'll find is that this product is now a bit more streamlined and scalable when it comes to the overall performance. And I was personally much happier with the end product. Look, when it comes to no-code tools, Bubble, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful options you can build with. Unlike most no-code tools, it's a full suite solution that allows you to create your own custom database, the design of your application, the workflows that stitch everything together and make it functional, as well as the ability to integrate with third-party tools and services. And all of that is in one single platform. So it's not like you're gonna to need to pay four different subscriptions for four different products to make that functional. <laughs> oh God, you're impressive. <laughs> and so that's why I personally choose to build with Bubble myself. And if you're not familiar with who I am, I'd recently worked with the Bubble team to write their how to build a blog series. This was a series that took the top products out there on the market, like Uber, Airbnb, and even Instagram, and explain the step-by-step -step instructions to rebuild a version of those applications entirely out of no code using their platform. And now while that written series was helpful for thousands of bubblers across the world, if you're anything like me, I do personally find it easier to follow a video tutorial, which is exactly what I'm doing with this YouTube channel. And so I did just want to point out that this YouTube channel and all of my content is something that I'm creating in my own time. It has no affiliation with Bubble at all. But when it comes to our tutorial today, I'm gonna to be explaining every single step you need in order to build your own Tinder MVP. This will include features like being able to register accounts, 
creating a user settings page where users can identify things like their gender, their sexual interests, as well as their location preferences. And of course, once we have that information, we can then build out a home page to start displaying potential matches to a user. And of course, on that home page, users will be able to swipe left or right on people that they want to match with. And when two users do swipe right on each other, we're going to create a new match in our application from where those users can then create a chat and send and exchange messages between each other. Look, there's just so many features that I want to cover throughout this build. So let's just open up our bubble editor and we can dive right into it. The first thing I wanted to cover within our build today isn't actually going to be a core feature that users will interact with, but instead I just wanted to take the time to build out the necessary data types and fields within our database. And this will be used to power all of the additional features that we're going to build out within our tutorial today. And now throughout our tutorial, I'm going to be keeping track of everything within a Notion doc. I'll be sure to share a link to this so that way you can access this template as well. But the reason I use Notion is because within this, I like to list out all of the data types and fields within my database, as well as a list of all of the features I'm going to add into my build. So that way I can tick these off as I walk through the process. And it just helps me stay on top of things in a more organized manner. But as I mentioned, I wanna focus first on how we can structure the necessary database and if you've never used a bubble before, this might be a little bit complex, but it's one of those things that the more you practice and experiment with it, the more you'll understand the core concepts. But of course, I'll be sure to explain everything in as much detail as I possibly can. What we're gonna do is we're gonna open up a brand new bubble editor here, and we're gonna head over to our data tab on the left-hand side. And what you might notice is that within your data types tab here, we already have an existing data type. And now, so within Bubble or any database, a data type is an overall entity which you need in order to create something within your application. So the way I like to think of structuring databases is that if a user ever needs to create something within our app, it should be a data type. So whether or not they're creating an account, so that's why we have a user data type here, whether they're creating a post, a message, a chat, these would all need to be data types. And then within each data type, you add a series of data fields. And that is the individual parts of information you'd like to store for each entity. So for every single user that's created, we'd need to store things like their name, their email address, their profile photo, and so on. And so they are the two core concepts you'll need to understand when creating a custom database in Bubble. So on the left hand side here, you'll be able to add in a series of all of the data types. And then on the right hand side, you'll be able to add in all of the information or data fields that you'd like to add within each data type. And now, as I mentioned, you'll see that the user data type has been added in by default. And that is because, of course, if you're creating an application where users need to register an account, you're going to need to have a user data type. So Bubble adds that in from the beginning. One thing I will point out is that within our overall user data type, you'll see there's some existing data fields. One of those is an email field, so we won't need to add that in. And that, of course, is because whenever someone registers an account, they're going to need a email and a password. There is also a password data field added within this data type. You just won't be able to view that within plain text just for security reasons, but it is there. And the other thing I'd just like to point out before we start building out our database is that you might see some text here that indicates that there is a privacy rule applied to this data type. If we were to click on that, it's going to send us through to our privacy tab here. And essentially what this default privacy rule enables in our app is an experience where users are only able to view the data that they create. And that's not the experience we want to use within our Tinder application today. So under this current privacy rule, if a user was to create an account, no one else in our application would be able to see that. 
Whereas because Tinder is almost like a social product, we want users to be able to see and interact with each other's accounts. So this privacy rule is not going to be effective for us. So what we're gonna to need to do is delete that by heading over to this little trash can icon here. We will click that and it will delete that from our privacy menu. If we were to jump back into our data tab then, we can now see that our user data type is publicly visible, which is exactly what we want. And when we add in any additional data types, we'll just need to make sure that this field here is not ticked or else it will add the same privacy setting. But now when it comes to building out our database, before we can add all of the data fields within our user data type, we'll need to add in the data types first. And the reason I add in all of my data types first is because we're gonna to need to actually link some data fields back to data types. And now I'll be sure to explain that in as much detail as I can when we cross that path. But if I was to jump into Notion here, I can see I have a couple of different overarching data types. So I have my user data type, which has already been added. I also have a separate data type called user image. And now the reason why I've broken this into a separate data type, and I haven't just included my images within our user data type, is because every single time you load a list of items within your database, so let's say on our Tinder homepage, we'd like to load a list of potential users for someone to swipe through. If we were to load, let's say 100 users, every single time a user is loaded, it's going to load all of the data fields within their account. And while there's not too many data fields here, if we were to load 100 users, it's going to multiply the amount of fields it's loading by 100. And while most of these are pretty basic, just text or number fields, that doesn't require a whole lot of computing power to actually load. But if we were starting to load a series of images under each user, because those file sizes are quite large, it can start to slow your application down. And so a good practice is to actually separate any of the larger items within your database into a separate data type. And then we can link this back to our original data type and choose to only load that content whenever it's completely necessary. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna head over to my bubble editor here. I'm going to add in a new data type called user image. I'll choose to create this. And another thing I should point out is that when you're creating your data types, you should never use a plural for each of these entries. So although a user will be able to upload multiple images, we're going to still call this data type a user image because an individual entry is just one image, but we can then later reference all of the images that were created by a particular user. So the actual overarching data type should never be a plural. What you'll find is that if you do add a plural, things can get quite confusing when you start referencing data types later on throughout your build. So you'll see that I never include a plural within my data type names. I'll then jump back into my Notion doc here and I can see that the next data type I'd like to add in is a match. So every single time two users like each other within our application, one of those users will be creating a match. So I'm going to jump into our bubble editor, add in a match data type. I'll jump back into Notion and I'm going to add in a chat now. So whenever two users have successfully matched, they can create a chat between them. And within that chat, they will be able to exchange messages, but the overarching chat itself will need to be a data type. So I'm going to add that in. And then as I mentioned, within each chat, users can send messages. So for every message that is sent, I'm going to create a new entry in our database. So I'll select that our message here will need to be a individual data type. You can see I just have a small typo there. If I was to jump back in to my Notion checklist, the next thing I'm gonna to need to add in is a list of option sets. And this is where things can get a little bit confusing, particularly if this is the first application you've ever built using Bubble. So within our database here, we've added in a list of data types. And now, as I mentioned, data types are perfect for whenever a user needs to create something within your app. So every single time a user sends a message, the user is going to create a message entry in our database. 
But what happens if we want to leverage some data that is not created by the user? And in some cases, you actually don't want to allow your users to create certain data. And a great example of this is, let's say you have a marketplace product and you want to create a list of categories that users can search through a list of services or products by. With those categories, you as the owner of the application should be the only person who can create those categories. You don't necessarily want your users to be able to create categories because if your users were creating them, there's no way to make sure that they won't include typos or even duplicates of existing categories that you have already created. And so this is where the idea of option sets comes into play. So within our menu here, you'll be able to see that we have a list of data types that users can create. But if you were to open up this option sets menu here, you'll see it looks very much the same as when you can create a data type. But these are essentially data types that only you can create within your database. Your users won't be able to access this. And within my build today, what I've done is I've broken down two separate types of option sets I'd like to add in. One is for the gender option that people can select within their profile, and the other is their sexual interests. And now the reason why I've selected to add these as option sets is because I, as the administrator of my application, want to have complete control over what options people can choose from. So in this case, I'm just gonna keep things relatively straightforward for my tutorial today, but I only want people to be able to choose from three different types of gender. There's male, female, and non-binary. And then when it comes to the sexual interests, I only want users to be able to choose from these three options here. And the reason why I've selected to create these as option sets is because later on throughout our tutorial, when we create a search algorithm, where we need to display a list of users to someone who's swiping through on their homepage. This is gonna give me complete control over what particular gender we display to users based on their sexual interests. And so what I'm gonna do is head over into my bubble editor here, and I'm going to create an overarching option set. I'll call the first one gender. And what you'll now see is that this actually looks quite comparable to how you can create data types. Only within our option set here, it's just going to allow me to add in the options that will sit within our overarching gender category. And so I'm going to add in the three options I've included within my Notion doc here. So I'm going to add in the male option, the female option, as well as the non-binary option. I'll choose to create that. And then I'd like to add an additional option set list called sexual interests. And once I create that, I'd like to add in the three options I've included within here. So there's men, women, and everyone. I will type those in. And that's all I'll need to add for my option sets now. I'm not gonna overcomplicate this and dive into any additional details. But when we build out our homepage, you'll see that this will give me the ability to identify if someone's sexual interests are, let's say, in women, in which case I can then show them only users whose gender is also female. And I can do the same thing for people who are interested in everyone. I can show them users whose interests are pretty much any of these genders. But what I'm gonna do is just jump back into my Notion checklist here and tick off that I finished adding in all of my option sets. And what I'd like to do from here after adding in all of my data types and option sets is start to add in all of the data fields that are gonna sit within them. And so as I mentioned, the data fields will store all of the information you want for each entry of this data type. So for every user, you can see that I want to store a name, a bio, an age, as well as things like their gender and their sexual interests. And so if we were to jump over into our bubble editor here, we're gonna open up our data types tab again. We'll select to open up our user data type and we can start to create our very first data field, which will be the name of the user. And now whenever you create a data field, you'll have the ability to select what type of field option you want this to be. So do you want this to be a text field, a number field, a date, an image, and so on. In this case, I want the name just to be a standard text field, so it's pretty straightforward. I'd also then like to determine the age of the user, so I'm gonna create a new field. 
I'm gonna call this age. And for this field type, I want this to actually be a number. I will choose to create that. One thing I'll point out is that you may have seen within my Notion doc here, I have two age fields. So I have one registered as a number and the other registered as text. And now the reason why I have these two separate age fields is because we're gonna be using a plugin today that allows us to display a user's name on top of an image that someone can swipe through. And in order to display someone's name, it only allows you to display text-based fields, not numbers. So I'm just gonna be including the age as a text option as well. So that way I can store it as a word. So I'm just gonna jump back into Bubble. I'll create another field. I'll call this age and just in brackets, I'm just gonna say this is the text version of the age. And then I'll be setting this field type to be the text option. I'll then also want to add in a user's bio. This will also be a text option. So that is the description of their profile. And then I'm going to add an additional field which will be called age preference. So this is going to be the age range in which someone wants to be displayed users within our application. So they can set that they're only interested in seeing people whose age is within let's say 18 to 30 or 30 to 50. And so this field type here is actually going to be a numeric range. It's relatively straightforward. I'll choose to create that. Then I'll be adding an additional field which will be called gender. And when it comes to this field type, this is where we're going to not set this as a text field, but I want to link this to my option sets that I've just added for our gender. And so if I was to select the gender option here, it just means that a user is going to be able to select one gender type that they represent themselves as, whether that be male, female, or non-binary. And because we're linking to our option set, they can easily choose an option from that predetermined list that I have created. I'll choose to create this. And now I'll also add in a field for the user's job title. And the field type here is very straightforward. I just want this to be a text-based field. And now within each user's account, let's say they're swiping on our homepage and they want to swipe left on someone. I'd like to add the person that they've just swiped left on to the list of users that they have disliked. And then if someone swipes right on someone, I want to add them to a list of users that they have in fact liked. And the way I can do this is by creating a data field called liked users. And I want to set this field type to be a user, which as you can now see is gonna link back to our user data type. But because someone can swipe right on multiple users, I'm going to tick that this field should be a list with multiple entries, which now means that this will be a list of users. So every single time someone swipes right on someone, I'm gonna be adding them to this person's list of liked users. I'll choose to create that. And then similarly, I'm gonna add a field here called disliked users. And this will also be a user field type with the ability to create this as a list with multiple entries. I can also create that. And then within a user's account, I'd also like to add in the location in which they reside. And if I was to set this to be a geographic address, later on I'm gonna explain how we can allow someone to choose either their exact address or a city or suburb that they live within. So I'm gonna create this. And once we've added in the user's location, I'd also like to create a way to store a user's location preference. So I want to determine how many kilometers or miles away we should display potential matches to this user. So let's say if someone sets their location preference to 20 kilometers, if a user is 30 kilometers away, we would not display that person to this user. And so I'm going to add a field called location preference. And this field is just going to be a number because this will determine a number of kilometers or miles away from a person. So I'm gonna to choose to create this. And then after storing the location of a user, what I'd like to do is create a data field that's going to identify their distance preference. So let's say a user would only like to be displayed matches within a 20 kilometer radius around them. 
they can predetermine that number and then if let's say a user was 30 kilometers away from that user they would not be displayed to this person and so i can create a field here called distance preference and this field type will just be a number so they can determine what number of miles or kilometers to set their distance preference as and then from here i'd like to add a field which determines a user's sexual interests and this field is going to link to our sexual interest option set that we had created. So a user can determine if they're interested in men, women, or everyone. I'll create this. And then finally, the very last field I'd like to add within our user data type is going to be the profile photo. So this is the main image that's going to be displayed for a user's account. And this field type here is just going to be a single image. I will create that and I can jump back in to my notion checklist here. I can highlight all of these data fields and tick off that I've added all of those in. I'll then move along to the next data type, which is our user image. So as I've mentioned, instead of storing a list of images under our user data type, I want users to be able to upload a series of additional images into our application. And so over on our user image data type, I'm going to add just a single data field called an image, which this field type is in fact going to be an image. And what you'll notice is that under every single data type, by default, there is a data field that determines who the creator of each entry is. So every single time someone uploads a user image, I can automatically reference this back to that user. So let's say if I ever wanted to display the full information of a user's profile, including all of the individual user images they've uploaded, I can easily just reference to display all of the user images created by a particular user. And this data type is actually relatively straightforward to build out. That's the only data field we're going to include. I'll jump back into Notion and tick that off. Then when it comes to our match, so as I mentioned, every single time two users swipe right on each other, I'd like to create a match in our database. And so under our match data type here, the first field I'd like to create is a list of all of the users who should belong to an individual match. And of course, within a match, there's just going to be two users. And so I'm going to create a field and I'm going to call this all matched users. And because I'd like to store a list of users, I'll set the field type here to be a user. And I will tick that this should be a list with multiple entries. And now what I'd also like to do within a match is just create an additional data field that's going to allow me to determine if the users in this match have started to exchange messages within a chat. And so I'm going to create a field here called match chat. And I'll be linking this to our chat data type. So if I scroll on down, I can select from the chat option. And there'll only be one chat between two users for every single match. So I won't be selecting that that is a list with multiple entries. And that's all of the data fields I'll need to add within our match data type. So I'll jump back into Notion and check those off. And then within every single chat in our application, I'm going to need to store some additional data. So if I open up my chat data type here, the first thing I'd like to determine is the users who are going to be added into a chat. And these will be the same users who were added into a match. So theoretically, let's say two users have matched in an application and they decide to create a chat. Within that chat, those two users will be added. And once they've been added into that chat, they can start to exchange messages within that chat. And I know that might sound a little bit confusing now, but when I actually walk you through the steps of building it out, it'll all make more sense. But what I want to do is just add a field here and I'll be calling this users. So these are all of the users that will belong to this chat. And because there's more than one user, I'll be selecting that the field type should be a user. And I will tick that that is a list with multiple entries. And then finally within a chat, I'd like to create a way to determine if a user has read the last message that they've received within the chat. So that way I can create an unread message notification. And the way in which I can do that is by creating a field that stores the date in which someone has last viewed this chat. 
And so I'm going to create a field here and I'll be calling this last viewed by user. And this field type will be a date. So that way I can put a timestamp on the time in which someone has last viewed a chat. And then I'll be able to determine if someone has received a message since the last time in which they've viewed the chat. I can then choose to display them an unread message notification. So I'll choose to create that. And that's all of the data fields I'll need to add within my chat data type. The very last two data fields I'll need to add in belong to our message data type. And so if I open this up, every single time a message is created, I'm going to need to store two things. The first is the content of the message itself. So this is just the text of the message. This field type will just be a standard text field. But the other thing I'd like to reference is the original chat that this message should belong to. So if users are exchanging a message within a chat, I just want to be able to store which chat it belongs within. So I'm going to create a new field here. I'm going to call it original chat. I can call it OG chat for short if I would like. And this field type, you probably guessed, but it will link back to our chat data type. So that way it has a relational value with it. And just like that, that is how we can build a completely custom database for a Tinder clone application. As you can see, it's a relatively straightforward process to build your own custom database without writing a single line of code. I can understand that if this was your first time, it might be a little bit overwhelming. But as I mentioned at the start of this section in our tutorial, the more you practice this, the more you'll truly be able to understand and play around with all of the different data types and fields. At this point in our tutorial, we can move along to one of the first core features that users are going to interact with throughout our Tinder clone today. And that is a home page where users can choose to swipe left or right on potential matches within our application. And when it comes to this feature within our tutorial today, I'm actually going to show you two different versions of this. And the reason I'm doing that is because when you're building your Tinder clone within Bubble, you can take advantage of two different types of plugins to create almost like the same experience. And the reason we're using a plugin is because we're going to need to leverage an existing piece of technology in order to create the swiping experience between users on our homepage. And within Bubbles platform, there's two different plugins that will create this Tinder experience. One is a free version of the plugin, which is created by Bubble themselves. And that's the plugin we're going to be using within this particular section of our tutorial today. And the other is a paid version of a plugin built by an external developer. And that version of the plugin was the demo you'd seen at the beginning of this tutorial. And the main difference between the two is that the free version of the plugin it doesn't give you as many additional design settings to customize. So while it is free, I personally would recommend using the paid version of the plugin just because it's going to create a much nicer user experience. However, throughout our overall tutorial today, I wanted to break down how we could use both versions of the plugins. So that way, whether or not you're using the free plugin or the paid plugin, you're going to know how to replicate Tinder's core product by the end of this tutorial. And so what we're going to do first today is just focus on building out a home page that utilizes the free version of the Tinder plugin built by Bubble. So I'm going to jump over into my Bubble editor here and over in my index page, the first thing I'd like to do is just create a new page within my application. I'm going to call this the home page. So I'm going to choose to create a new page here and I'm going to call this home number one. And that's just because this is going to be the first version of my home page that I'm going to show you throughout our tutorial. The option with the pay plugin will be home page number two. I'm going to choose to create this page here. And then the first thing I'm going to do on this home page is just take the time to upgrade the responsive settings here to the new Flexbox responsive engine. And so at the point of recording this tutorial, the default responsive engine is not the Flexbox engine. It's currently still in beta, as you can see here. So if you are watching this tutorial and you've selected on your page, you've opened up your element inspector here, and you can see that you have the option to upgrade to the responsive beta. You just need to click this and then Bubble will work its magic on your page and update this to the new responsive experience. 
And then once I've updated this page, I'll now see that I have the layout tab here, which is going to allow me to update the responsive settings and dimensions of this page itself. And now when it comes to this page, I'm going to want to update the container layout here to be the column option. And the reason why I've selected the column option is because it's perfect for stacking elements vertically on your page. So if you're building a page where you want to build elements on top of each other, you'll need to select the column option. And as I always mention, in pretty much 99% of the use cases, I personally prefer to select it that the container layout of the page should in fact be a column. I'm then going to update the preset page width to be a mobile, which is just going to reduce the width of this page to be 380 pixels. But of course, I'm gonna be explaining how we can make this page responsive regardless of the user's device size. I'm then going to jump over into my appearance tab just because I'd like to update the background color of this page. So just for the time being, I just wanna update the background color just to be a light shade of gray. So that way I can see where the actual page sits within my bubble editor. Of course, when we go to preview or publish our application, we can change this back to be white. But for the time being, I'm just gonna leave this as gray. And now when it comes to this page, before I add in my plugin that's going to create our Tinder-like experience, the first thing I'm going to do is add in a logo followed by some text at the top of our page. And in order to add those elements side by side, I'm actually gonna to need to add a group onto my page first. Because if you remember, the layout configuration of my page was set to be a column, which means it's only going to stack elements on top of each other. Whereas if I want to stack elements side by side, I'm gonna to need to select that they should be the row option, but I'll want to keep the overall page itself as a column. So I'm going to scroll on down to my containers menu here, and I'm gonna to choose to add a group onto my page. As I mentioned, I'm gonna set that the container layout here should be a row, which just means that elements are going to be positioned side by side within it. I'm also just gonna to jump to my appearance tab here because I'd like to remove the style of this group. And I'm going to update my background color to be a flat color here. I'm happy to leave that as white. That's just going to allow me to see where the actual group sits on my page for the time being. And now within this group element, as I mentioned, I want to just display almost like a fire logo, like the Tinder logo itself, followed by the word Tinder. And that's just going to display at the top of our page. And in order to add in that logo, I'm actually just gonna use an icon element. So if I head to my visual elements here on the left, I'm going to select from an icon. I'll choose to add this in. And if I just type in the word fire, I'm just gonna search for this little fire icon here, which is kind of similar to the Tinder icon itself. I'm then just going to remove the style of this just because I want to customize the color code of this. I have a pink color code I'm gonna use here. If you'd like that, it's double F5864. I'm then also just gonna to want to update the size of this icon because at the moment it's a little too big. So I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab here and I'm gonna set the width of this to be 40 pixels and the height to be 40 pixels. And now I am gonna keep the options ticked here to keep this as a fixed width. And the reason for that is because at any given time, regardless of the size of a user's page, I'm always gonna want this to be this size. So 40 pixels by 40 pixels. What I'm then gonna do is add in a text element beside this that's going to display the word Tinder. And because I've set this group container layout to be a row, what you'll notice is that of course it is now stacking this text element beside the actual logo itself. And as I mentioned, this is just going to display the word Tinder. And when it comes to the style of this element, I'm just gonna remove the default style here because I'd like to update the font size to be 30. I'd also like to update the font color to be the same pink color code as our icon next to it. And I'd also just like to bold this text here. I'm then going to head to our layout tab. And when it comes to the layout settings of this text element, I'm going to once again, keep this to be a fixed width. Only this time I'm gonna update the width here to be 90 pixels. And the reason why I've selected 90 pixels is because that's roughly how much space we'll need to fit in this particular text element. The way I got there was just through trial and error. So let's say if I wanted to add in 100 pixels, you can see there's a little too much space. I could add in 90 pixels and it's almost roughly on the last letter there. And by ensuring that this is a fixed width, this element isn't going to expand out or contract based on the size of the page. What I would like to do, however, is now update the responsive settings of this white group that both of these elements sit within. 
because I'm going to want this group to collapse around these elements and then be positioned in the very center of my page. And so what I'm going to do is unselect that this element should be fixed width. And then I'm just going to set the minimum width here as zero. And I'm going to tick this option to fit the width of this group to the content within it. And what you'll now see is that the width of this group just automatically collapses around all of the elements that sit inside of it. And look, to be honest, because we have this option selected for the height as well, I'm going to set the minimum height here to be zero. And because we are fitting the height of this element to the content inside of it, it will collapse nicely around that as well. I'm then gonna to want to move this whole group in the center of my page. So I'm gonna update the horizontal alignment of this group to be in the center there. And then I'm going to scroll on down and just add in 10 pixels of margin at the top here. And what you'll now see is that that is not touching the very top of my page. If you really wanted, we could now also update the color of this group. So if I head to my appearance tab, I could just set that there's no background color needed. And what you'll now see is that these elements just sit side by side nicely and you can't tell that they're actually inside of a group. And now below this element, this is where I'm going to actually add in the main feature of our home page, which is a pile of user images that a user can swipe through in order to find potential matches. And in order to add that into our page, we're gonna to need to install a free plugin built by Bubble. So we're gonna head over to our plugins menu here. We're gonna to choose to open up our plugin library. I'm gonna type in the word Tinder. And what you'll see is that there's two options between the plugins here. There's our free plugin built by Bubble, and then there's the paid option. And now later on throughout our tutorial, I'm gonna be explaining how we can rebuild this home page with the paid plugin, just because that actually is my preferred choice. It gives you much more flexibility in terms of what you can do with the design of it. But I also just wanna show you how you can use the free option here. So I'm gonna to choose to install that plugin there. I'll then jump back into my design tab here and under your visual elements, what you'll see is that you have the Tinder pile element that you can now add onto your page. And as soon as you add this in, you'll start to see why I'm going to also show you how to use the paid plugin in a moment. But the Tinder pile itself doesn't look very enticing. It just displays an image element on top of a photo card. And we're gonna make a couple of different changes to this, but it's still not gonna look the absolute best. But what I'd like to do is just head over to my layout tab and move this to the next position on my page, just so that way it sits below our elements above it there. And now because the container layout of a page was set to be a column, these elements are gonna be stacked on top of each other. What I do wanna do is just update the styling of this element and then give it a data source. So that way it knows which particular users to search through in my database. So I'm gonna start by heading to my appearance tab here. I'm going to unselect this option to show the card title, which is just going to remove that text below it. We're gonna add in our own group in a moment that's going to display the name and the age of the person that's within this card. And what I'm then gonna do is head over to my layout tab here, and I'm gonna update the width and height of this element. I'm gonna make it 360 by 360. And now the reason why I've selected the width to be 360 pixels is because I'd like to horizontally align this in the center of my page, which just means that if my whole page is 380 pixels in width, it's going to just add in 10 pixels of margin on each side. So that way the borders of this element are not touching the sides of my page. I'd also just like to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top. So that way it doesn't touch my Tinder logo above it there. And now one thing I would like to point out is that at the time of recording this tutorial, the responsive engine is still currently in beta and the responsive settings do not yet apply to plugins, although that is something that Bubble will support in the near future. So at this point in time, I can only make this plugin a fixed width and height, meaning this will always remain 360 by 360. So if a user was to view this on a larger page, Although this plugin will sit in the center of our page, it's not going to expand or contract based on the size of the page itself, which honestly is, in my opinion, quite fine for a Tinder product, just because you'll find that the Tinder product itself is a mobile native application, meaning that users will most likely only be using it on a mobile device. However, if you ever wanted to build this out to be responsive on a desktop device, once Bubble supports these responsive settings, what you'll just need to do is set the minimum width as zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. 
and that will just allow this element to continually expand or contract based on the size of the page. But within today's tutorial, I'm just going to leave this as 360 by 360. One additional thing I should also point out is that although the image card here looks like it only takes up two thirds of the actual element, the image itself will in fact be a square. So it will most likely take up all of this space here when we take a preview of it later on. But what we will need to do from here is just head over to our UI builder and open up the appearance tab of this element. So now that we've finished configuring the design settings of it, I'd like to give it a data source. And this is just going to allow us to determine which particular users should be displayed within this particular Tinder pile for every single user. So of course, we're only gonna to want to display users whose gender and location as well as age matches the parameters that we're going to store within a user's account. And the way we can do this is by updating, first of all, the type of content we want to display within this Tinder pile. In this case, I want to pull from our database a list of all of the users. But then when it comes to the data source, I'm just gonna need to identify which particular users I want to display to the person who's logged in. Because of course, I won't want to display every single user. I'm just gonna to want to display the ones who meet their preferences, like I mentioned before. So for our data source here, I'm gonna perform a search through our database for all of the users where the age of this user is equal to or greater than the current users, their age preference, the minimum number within their age preference. So if their age preference is, let's say a minimum of 24 and a maximum of 50, it's only going to display users where the age is equal to or greater than the minimum number they've given. And then going to add in another constraint that's going to only display the users where their age is equal to or less than the current user. So the person who's logged in and is swiping through matches, their age preference, the maximum number there. And then from here, what I'd also like to do is add another constraint that's just going to only display users within a certain location from the user's location preferences. And so I'm going to perform a search through our database, not only for users that fit within this age range, but also users where their location field that they have stored within our database. So that could be things like the city or suburb that they live within. When their location is within, and now I'm going to want to pull a distance value that I'd like their location to be within. And in order to determine what the maximum distance within should be to the current user who's swiping through potential matches, I'm going to reference the current user, their distance preference, which in our database, if you remember, is set as a number. So that's just going to be the number of kilometers that they would like to be shown matches for. So when the location of the person who's being searched and displayed on our Tinder pile here, when their location is within the user's preference, and now I'm gonna base this on kilometers. If you wanted to make it miles, you could select that. And I want to recognize when this user's location is within X kilometers of the current user, their location, that's going to be filtered into our search as well. So now you can start to see that we're creating our own small little algorithm here that's just going to filter out which particular users should be displayed to the current user who's swiping through matches. And what I'd like to do is just change the way that these users are sorted and displayed. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose to sort these randomly. So that way each person gets a fair rotation throughout this pile. And one thing I will point out is that you may have noticed at this point that I haven't added any filters to filter out people by their gender. And the reason I'm doing that is because in a moment, we're just gonna need to create a couple of different search algorithms to determine which users should be displayed to someone else based on their own sexual preferences. So at this given point in time, we would be searching for any user whose age is within this certain range and their location is within a certain distance to the current user based on their preference. So right now it's displaying all genders, whether that be male, female, or non-binary. So this search result here would be catered to people who have a open sexual preference. So those are people who are happy to see options of everyone, whether they be male, female, or non-binary. 
What we'll be doing in a moment though is just creating a condition that's just going to recognize if the person who's logged in, if let's say they're only interested in males, we're gonna perform another search. Only in that case, we're gonna create a constraint where we only search for users where their gender is male. And then we're gonna create another condition that's going to cater for people interested in women and so on. But from here, what we're just going to need to do is add some additional customizations onto this particular search here. So within our Tinder clone today, once we've displayed a list of users to someone that they could either like or dislike, I just want to make sure that if someone has swiped left or right on that user, that person is not displayed again within this pile which is just going to mean that a user will continually be shown fresh new people that they could potentially match with. And I also just want to make sure that the user doesn't see themselves. As much as we'd all like to swipe right on ourselves, we just want to make sure that we avoid displaying the own user within our pile. So I'm just going to choose to close this search here. And what you'll see is I have this little more option next to my data source. And if I was to just type in the word filtered here, you'll see I have the option to filter this search which means that I'm going to further refine this search down. And the reason why I'm selecting the filtered option is because it gives you a couple of different advanced features that you don't have on your original search. And in this case, what I'm gonna to want to do is just make sure that I'm excluding any users who are already within the list of people that the current user has liked or disliked. And in that case, I'm just going to filter those out. So I'm going to add yet another constraint onto my additional filter here. And the way in which I can exclude any users that someone has already liked or disliked is by pulling through their unique ID that's stored within our bubble database. And I can just reference if their unique ID sits within the current users list of people that they have liked or disliked, I can exclude them from our search. So I'm just gonna type in the word unique here. And I'm only gonna to want to display users whose unique ID isn't within the current user, their list of liked users. And now one thing I would like to point out is that within this list of users, Bubble's essentially just going to store a list of unique IDs for each one of those users. A unique ID is just going to be a long string of numbers that are allocated to each person. So no two IDs would be the same. And in this case, I'm only going to want to display anyone whose unique ID isn't within the current user's list of people that they've already liked. And the way I can filter that out is by once again typing in the word unique. And you'll see I have the option to select the each item's unique ID here. And so that way Bubble's just going to perform a search for someone's unique ID and it's going to recognize if that isn't in the current user's list of people that they've liked, that person will in fact remain to be displayed within this list. And this is just going to ensure that if someone has already liked a user within our application, they will not be displayed for a second time. I'm then gonna need to create a way to filter out anyone who the user has disliked because we obviously wouldn't want to display that person as well. So I'm gonna add another constraint here and I'm going to type in the word unique ID and I'm going to only display users whose unique ID isn't within the current user, their list of disliked users, all of the unique IDs within that. So I'm just gonna type in the word unique and select from each item's unique ID. And then finally, I'm gonna to want to filter out the current user themselves. So I just wanna make sure that the current user is not being displayed within this Tinder pile. So I'm going to add another constraint here and I'm going to only display the users where their unique ID is not. One thing I should point out is that if you want to exclude something within Bubble, you just choose both of these open arrows next to each other. So this just means is not. And I'm gonna select when the unique ID is not the current user, their unique ID, that person will then be displayed. And so at this point in time, just to reiterate everything we've built on this data source, we're searching for a list of all of the users by their age and location, not their gender. And then we're just filtering out, making sure we're not displaying anyone who has already been liked, disliked, and is not the current user. And then the last thing we'll need to configure is this field here that's just going to recognize which image will need to be displayed within our Tinder pile. And in this case, I want this to just be the profile photo of the particular user. 
What you'll also see is that you're able to upload your own custom images here for the actions that occur when someone is either liked or disliked. So when someone swipes right or swipes left, you can choose which image is gonna be displayed on the picture element itself. And now before we finish building out the rest of our page here, I'm just gonna need to create almost like another search algorithm on our data source here. So at this point in time, this search algorithm is catered for people who are interested in anyone, regardless of their gender. But what happens if someone has listed that they're only interested in seeing men, as well as someone who's only interested in seeing women? What we're gonna do is we're gonna head to our condition tab here. And what we can now create is a condition that's going to recognize if the current user, if their sexual interest is, and now I'm going to recognize the men option. And now of course this is pulling from our option set that we had added in our database. So if I was to open up my database here, you'll remember we had created two option sets, one for gender, which just includes the different genders here, and one for sexual interests which just includes what someone is interested in being displayed. And in this case, I'd just like to recognize if their sexual interest is in fact men. What I'm gonna to want to do is update our data source for all of the users that are displayed within this particular Tinder pile. And I'm gonna pretty much replicate the exact same original data source, only this time I'm just going to add an extra constraint that just refines the users by their gender, obviously only displaying those who recognize themselves as males. So I'm gonna to head to our condition tab here and underneath my data source, I'm gonna perform a search through our database. Once again, for all of the users where their age is equal to or greater than the current user, so the person who's logged in swiping through matches, their age preference, the minimum number for that age preference. And then I'm also going to refine the users when their age is equal to or less than the current user, their age preference, the maximum value. And then similar to before, I'm going to refine this search by the location, just making sure that we're only displaying people within the location proximity that someone has labeled that they're interested in matching with people. So I'm gonna recognize that I only want to display users where their registered location is within a certain number of kilometers. And in order to get that distance, we're going to display the current user their distance preference, which is stored as a number. I'd like to register that in kilometers. And I want to identify when the location is within X kilometers of the current user's location. So I'm gonna pull that in. And then finally, because this is the condition that's only going to display users who are men, because that is what the person is interested in, I'm going to filter this search and only display users where their gender equals and I'm going to select from the male option. Similar to before, I'm then going to sort these options randomly so that way each user has a fair amount of distribution throughout this Tinder pile. And then from here, I'm also then just gonna to need to add my additional filter just to make sure we're not displaying anyone who has already been liked or disliked from this user. So I'm going to select the more option. I'll type in the word filtered. I can choose this. And similar to before, I'm going to filter out these options and only make sure we're going to display people whose unique ID isn't within the current user, their list of liked users, the unique IDs within all of that list. And I apologize if I'm gonna be moving through this fairly quickly, but this is the exact same constraints that we had added onto our previous data source. So I'm going to add in another constraint and only display users where the unique ID of that user isn't within the current user's disliked user, their unique IDs. So I'll select the each item's unique ID. And now finally, I'm just gonna to want to ensure that we're not going to display the current user within this pile. So I'm going to filter out when the unique ID is not the current user's unique ID as well. And that's everything we'll need to add for this particular search algorithm. What I'd like to do though is create one last condition that's just going to recognize if the current user's sexual interest is listed as women. In which case, I just like to filter out the users that are displayed by this exact same search query, only I just want to update the gender that we're searching for users by. 
So I'm going to define a new condition here and I'm going to recognize if the current user, if their sexual interest is in fact women. I'm going to once again update the data source of my Tinder pile here and I will perform a search through my database for all of the users where the age is equal to or greater than the current user, their age preference, the minimum age within their preference. I'd also like to recognize that I want this user's age to be equal to or less than the current user, their age preference, its maximum range. Then I'd also like to identify that the user's location should be within the current user, their distance preference in terms of kilometers away from the current user's location. And again, this is the exact same as the previous search we've added. I'm changing nothing. The only thing I do wanna change is that I want to now only display users where the gender equals female. And then I'm going to want to sort these randomly. And then finally, I'm going to close this because I want to select the more option. I'm gonna type in the word filtered and I'm only gonna to want to display users where their unique ID is not within the current user, their liked users, each item's unique ID. I'm also going to only display users where their unique ID isn't within the current users, disliked users, each item's unique ID. And then finally, I'm gonna exclude the unique ID of the current user. So I'm only gonna to want to display someone if their unique ID is not the current users, is not the unique ID as well. I can then close that and that wraps up everything I wanted to include in terms of our search algorithm here. I know that took a little bit to configure and look, if you are relatively new to Bubble, don't stress if you found that a little bit complex. Even I found that it took me some time to figure out how to add all of these constraints here. But thankfully, it's my job to teach you and explain what exactly you'll need to include and not include. But at this point in time, we've created three different search algorithms that are going to cater for any user's sexual preferences, whether they're interested in everyone or men and women. And now at this point, what I'd like to do is just display some additional information about this particular user in our Tinder card. So I want to showcase things like their name and their age to the user, because at this point in time, our Tinder pile is only gonna be displaying the user's image. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add in a group element below our Tinder pile here. And within that group, I'll be storing some text elements so I can display the user's name and their age, as well as things like their job title. Before I do that though, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to double click on my page here and I'm gonna to head to my layout tab. And just for the time being, I'm just gonna update the size of this page here just to be at 1000 pixels in height. And of course we can change that when we go to preview or publish our application. But I just wanna give myself some additional space to work with at the moment. And now below our Tinder pile, as I mentioned, I'm gonna be adding a group element onto my page here. When it comes to this group element, the first thing I'm gonna do is head over to my appearance tab. I'm going to remove the style of it just so I can update the background color of it to be a flat color. Now for the time being, I might just make this background a light shade of red just so I can see where it actually sits on my page. And now when it comes to the elements I'll be adding into this group, I'm gonna be stacking them on top of each other. So at the top, I want to display the user's name and their age. Then below that, I'd like to display the user's job title. And because I'm stacking elements from top to bottom, so vertically, I'm gonna need to update the container layout of my group here to be a column. And then from here, I'm also just going to update the width of the group for now. And I'll be coming back to update the height and the margins in a moment. But what I'm gonna do is unselect that this element should be fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite, which just means that if I open up my responsive tab here, this group will be responsive across any device size. And one thing I will point out is that when it comes to the width of our Tinder pile here, as I mentioned, once Bubble gives access to update the responsive settings here of this layout, 
you'll be able to make this element just as responsive as this red group here. But the other thing I should note is that when a user is viewing this on a mobile device, let's say the device size is about 380 pixels, which is the size of our editor. These will be roughly the same size, so a user won't be able to tell the difference anyway. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back into my UI build here. And before I update the rest of the responsive settings on this red group, I'm going to start adding the elements I'd like to display within it. So whenever a user's profile photo is being displayed within our Tinder pile here, I'd like to display their name below this. So I'm going to add a text element into my red group here. And now the way I can reference the person's name who's being displayed within our Tinder pile is by inserting dynamic data. And then what I can do is I can type in the word Tinder and I'll be able to reference the data of the Tinder pile user. So that is the user who is currently being displayed within our Tinder pile. So I can select the current slide option. And now because that links to our user data type, I can reference any of the data fields that sit within it. So in this case, I want to display that user's name. Then I'm going to add in a comma followed by a space because in this case, I'd like to then display the user's age. So I'm going to insert dynamic data once again. I'll pull data from the Tinder pile user, the current slide that's being displayed, their age. And now from here, what I'm going to want to do is just remove the style of this text here, because when it comes to this text, I'm just going to update the size of this to be 22. I'm also going to bold this text. And of course, I'm going to need to update the responsive settings of this text element. So that way it expands across the full width of our red group that it sits within. So I'm going to jump over to my layout tab here and I'm going to unselect that this element should be fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And then when it comes to the height, I'm also going to set that as zero because we have this option ticked here to fit the height of the element to the content inside of it. And then finally, I'd also just like to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top. So that way this text element doesn't touch the border of our Tinder pile on our page. And now below this text element, I'd like to add in another that is just going to display the job title of the user who's being displayed in our Tinder pile. However, beside that text, what I'd like to do is add a little information icon that when clicked expands out a group below our Tinder pile here where we can display all of the user's additional images. Because with our Tinder pile here, as it stands right now, we're only displaying the user's profile photo, which is one image. Of course, though, within a user's account, they have the ability to add in multiple images. So we're just going to need to create a way for a user to expand almost like an additional preview of all of the extra images that added into their Tinder account. And so because I want to display a text element on the left and then a little information icon on the right, what I'm going to need to do is add a group within my group. So if you remember this red group here, it's container layout is set to be a column because I want to stack elements on top of each other, which is still true. However, within just one row of my group here, I'd like to stack elements horizontally. So side by side, which just means I'm going to have to add in another group within my existing group here. And I'll be setting the container layout of that new group to be a row, not a column. And this is where you can start to see that groups are almost like Lego blocks when it comes to bubble. You can really build any experience or design style you would like if you just stack multiple groups on top of each other or around each other. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to head to my containers menu here. I'm going to insert a group into my existing group. And now when it comes to this group, the first thing I'm going to do is just jump over to my appearance tab because I'd like to remove the current style of it. In this instance, I just want to give it a custom background color. So I'm going to select that the background style should be a flat color. If I wanted, I could just leave this as white because I can tell the difference between this group and the red group that it sits within. I'm then going to jump over to my layout tab. And as I mentioned, I'm going to need to update the container layout of this group to be a row because I'd like to stack two elements in this side by side. I'm also then just going to update the responsive width settings of this group for the time being. So I'm going to like always unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And from here, I'm going to start by adding in my very first element into this white group, which is just going to be a text element. And in this case, I just want to display the job title of the person whose profile is being displayed in our Tinder pile. 
So similar to our previous text above it there, I'm going to insert dynamic data and display the Tinder pile user, the current slide. So that's the person who's being displayed on this slide, their job title. I'm also then going to need to update the responsive settings of this text element. So I'm gonna jump over to my layout tab here. Like always, I will unselect that this element should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And then finally, I'm going to update the minimum height to also be zero. So that way it collapses around the text inside of it. Now, as I mentioned before, beside this text element, I just like to add in a small little information icon that when clicked is going to expand an additional group below this, which will then display a list of all of the extra photos that someone has added to their Tinder account. And so in order to add in that information icon, I'm gonna to head to my visual elements. I'll select to add an icon into my group. And what you'll see is because our white group is container layout is set as a row, these elements are now gonna be positioned beside each other. I'm then gonna type in the word info and I'll pull in this little circle information icon. And from here, what I'm gonna do is just remove the style of this information icon, just because I'd like to update the color of it to be a light shade of gray. If you'd like that color code, it's C4, C4, C4. And then I'm gonna jump over to my layout tab because I'd like to update the size of this information icon. And in this case, I'm going to just set the width to be 25 pixels. And I'll be leaving that as a fixed width because I'm always gonna want this to be 25 pixels. And then when it comes to the height, I'm going to set that as 25 pixels as well. And I'll also be leaving that as a fixed height. So now this element will always remain 25 pixels by 25 pixels. And that's actually all I want to add within this white group here. So I'm going to click on the white group itself. I'm then going to open up our layout tab and I'm gonna now set the minimum height of this group to be zero. And because we have this option selected here to fit the height of this group to the content within it, it's going to collapse nicely around all of our text there. And then finally, I'd just like to add in 10 pixels of margin at the top of this group and 10 pixels of margin at the bottom. And now that's actually everything I wanted to add within my overall red group as well. So I'm now going to select on my red group here. I'll jump to the layout tab of this element. And then I'm going to set the minimum height to now be zero. Once again, making sure we have this option selected to fit the height of this element to the content within it. And then finally, I'd just like to add in 10 pixels of margin on the left and 10 pixels of margin on the right, which is just going to ensure that when a user is viewing this on a mobile device, this group will be in line with the Tinder pile that it sits beneath. And now you can start to see that our home page is coming together quite nicely. There is a few additional things I'd like to add to it though before we take a preview at how this is going to function. And the first is, as I'd previously just mentioned, we'd added in a little information icon here that when clicked, I'd just like to display a list of all of the additional images within a user's account. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add in an additional group below this red group on our page here. And that group is gonna be hidden by default. And within that group, I'm gonna be displaying the list of additional images. But I'm only gonna want this group to be displayed whenever someone clicks on this information icon. And then if they were to click on this icon again, I'd like to hide that group. And so in order to do that, as I mentioned, we're gonna start by adding a group element onto our page here. And when it comes to this group, the first thing I'm going to do is just head over to my appearance tab. And from here, I'm just going to remove this style of this group because I'd like to set a flat color as the background. I'm then just going to update the group color just to be a light shade of yellow, just so once again, I can see where it actually sits on my page here. And then when it comes to the responsive settings of this yellow group here, I'm going to set the container layout to be a row. And now within this group, I am gonna only display one element, and that's gonna be a repeating group element, which I'll highlight in a moment. But the reason I'm selecting to set the container layout as a row is because when the container layout is in fact a row, it gives you the additional container alignment options, which will just allow me to ensure that the element I add within this is going to be centered both horizontally and vertically. But for the time being, all I'm gonna to want to change here within our layout tab is of course the container layout and also the width settings of this group. So I'm going to unselect that this element should be a fixed width. 
I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And now within this group, as I'd previously mentioned, I'd like to display a list of all of the additional images that a user who's being displayed on our Tinder pile has stored within their account. And in order to display a list of items from your database, there's an element within Bubble that can do exactly this, and it's referred to as a repeating group. So within our containers menu here, if I was to add a repeating group into my yellow group, the first thing you'll notice is that a repeating group just looks like a list of cells, almost like a spreadsheet. And that's because it is. It allows you to display a list of items that it can pull from your database. And whenever you need to display a list of things within a bubble application, a repeating group element is the exact item you'll need to use. A good example of when you'd use a repeating group is let's say if you were building out something like an Instagram homepage. When you're creating a feed, you'd want to display a list of posts. And so what you do is you'd add a repeating group element onto your page. You would edit what's going to be displayed in the very first cell of your repeating group. And then Bubble would automatically know to populate all of the additional cells in your repeating group based on the data within your database. So it would pull through all of the Instagram posts and display each of their unique images. And today what we're going to do is pretty much a very similar experience. We're going to create a repeating group that scrolls horizontally across our page. And it's just going to pull all of the additional images that have been stored in our database that match the person's profile who is being displayed on our Tinder pile here. And so before we can update the responsive settings of our repeating group, I'm just going to jump into our appearance tab. Because we are wanting to pull data from our database, when it comes to a repeating group, you'll just need to identify what particular data you'd like to display. And in this case, I'd like to display a list of images. So if I scroll right on down to the bottom, you can see here that I'm able to select the image option. And when it comes to the data source of which images I'd like to display within my database, I'm going to perform a search through my database for all of the user images data type. So these are all the additional images that have been added outside of a user's profile photo. I'm going to want to search for all of the user images where the person who created them equals the same value as the Tinder pile user its current slide. So now it's going to search through all of the images created by the person who's being displayed within our Tinder pile. And once I've identified that I'm going to search through all of my user images data type, I'll just need to reference the data field within that that actually stores the image itself. So I'd like to display each item's images. So if I scroll on down, you'll see the option here to display each user images the image data field linked to that. And that's exactly how you can configure the data source of a repeating group. What I would like to do now is just update the layout of this repeating group, and then we'll need to jump over to the layout tab so we can update some of the responsive settings. And so when it comes to this repeating group at the moment, as you can see, it's positioned to display items in a list from top to bottom. Whereas as I mentioned, I'm gonna try and create an experience similar to the real world Tinder product where a person can horizontally swipe through a list of images. And so in order to do that, we're going to need to make a couple of changes to the number of rows and columns that are being displayed here. What we're going to do is we're going to unselect that this should be a fixed number of rows and also unselect that this should be a fixed number of columns. And what you'll now see is that we have the ability to update the scroll direction of our repeating group. And instead of scrolling from top to bottom, I'd like to scroll from side to side. So I'm going to select the horizontal option. And from here, what you'll see is that our repeating group is now displaying a list of nine images across all of these cells. And what I'd like to actually do is just display one image here, one image next to this, and then a list of additional images that someone can swipe horizontally across through. And so in order to display one image, I'm going to need to increase the minimum height and width of each repeating group cell. So instead of having nine smaller cells, I just want to have one big cell. And the way we can do that is by updating the minimum height and width here. I'm going to set the minimum height at 320 pixels and then also the minimum width at 320 pixels. And what you'll now see is that we have a larger amount of space to work within. I should also point out that when I'm working on a repeating group, I also like to just add a solid border around it. Because if I was to click away from our repeating group, at the moment you can't really see where it sits on our page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the repeating group again and I'm going to remove the style of it here. 
I'm just going to scroll on down to the border and add a solid border on this. And now what you'll see is a border around all of the edges of this repeating group. And if I was to scale that across my page at all, you'll also be able to see where all of the individual cells lie within it. And so what I'm going to do, because I've updated the minimum height and row to be 320 pixels, and now the reason I have selected 320 pixels is just because this is roughly the size I would like to display a single image within. So each image from a user's profile will be 320 by 320. But at this point in time, our repeating group is only displaying one cell, whereas I'd like to display as many across as I possibly can. And this is where we'll need to jump over into our layout tab here. And now when it comes to the layout of this repeating group, the first thing I'm going to do is update the container layout. I'd like this to be a row. Once again, although I am going to only be displaying one image within our repeating group, I'm setting the layout to be a row because it's going to give me some additional alignment options, which is just going to ensure me that the image that I add within this in a moment will indefinitely be in the center of our cell. I'm also then just going to update the width of our repeating group here. So I'm going to unselect that this element should have a fixed width. And what you'll now see is because it has an infinite width here, we can now see an additional repeating group cell beside this. And that cell is going to display our next image. And as you can see, it's only displaying a small portion of that image, which is just going to prompt a user to scroll across horizontally to view the remaining part of that image. But one thing I would like to point out is that when it comes to the minimum width of our repeating group, I'd like to set this to be 320 pixels. And the reason why I've selected 320 pixels as the minimum and not zero as a minimum, like I would normally do, is because if you remember in our appearance tab here, we'd set the minimum height and width of our rows to be 320 pixels. So I won't want our repeating group to get any smaller than that or else it's gonna to start to cut off our image. And so back in our layout tab, I'd also just like to update the minimum height here to be 320, which is just going to ensure that once again, it is the same size as the image we're going to add into this. And one thing I should point out is that if I was to jump into my responsive tab here, and if we were viewing this page on a mobile device, it's going to display one image followed by a portion of the other, and a user can scroll across to view all of the additional images. But if someone was viewing this on a desktop device, they would in fact see a longer list of all of the additional images. So our repeating group is automatically going to scale or contract based on how much space it can afford to display on our page. And that's what I love about Bubble is that it's going to take care of all of the heavy lifting for us. So if we were to scale our page down, it's now going to display a smaller portion of that second image. If I jump back into my UI builder though, what I'd like to do now is actually add in the image I'm going to display within our repeating group. And so what I'm going to do is just head up to my visual elements here. I'll select to add in an image element into my repeating group cell. And when it comes to displaying the additional user images, this is a very straightforward process. Because we have already updated the data source on our repeating group here, to search through all of the user images that were created by the person whose profile is being displayed. And because we've identified that we want to display the image data field of all of those user images, actually displaying that image within a picture element is as simple as inserting dynamic data and just displaying the current cell's image, which is just going to pull the data from the relevant cell within our repeating group. So in cell number one, it's going to display image number one, Cell number two, it's going to display image number two. While I'm working on our images here, I'm also going to update the borders to be a solid color, just so I can see where it actually sits within our repeating group cell. And then finally, I'd also just like to head over to our layout tab because I'd like to update the height and width of each of our images here. And similar to our repeating group, I'm going to unselect that this element should be fixed width. However, I am going to also leave the minimum width as 320. I'm also going to set the minimum height to be 320 pixels. And what you'll now see is that this image is going to take up all of the space within our repeating group cell. And there won't be any space between two images. They're going to be placed side by side. And of course, if I was to scale my page out on a larger device, because we have a infinite max width and infinite max height, this image is also going to scale up accordingly. And that's everything I'll need to configure when it comes to this image element. 
One thing I'd like to do is just quickly jump back to my yellow group that our repeating group sits inside of and just add in some margin around this so that way it's not touching the very sides of our page. And now in order to access my yellow group, what you'll see is that my repeating group sits over the top of it. So I can't physically click my yellow group. And so if I select my repeating group here, and I can tell right now by the name of this element that I am viewing my repeating group image. What I'm going to want to do is right click on this and choose the select first parent option. And because our repeating group sits within our yellow group, that yellow group is referred to as its parent, which now means that I can select on this group itself. Under my layout tab for this yellow group, I'm just going to set the minimum height to be zero because we have this option ticked to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it. And then I'm just going to scroll on down and add in 10 pixels of margin on the left and 10 pixels of margin on the right, which is just going to ensure that it doesn't touch the borders of my page. I'd also just like to add in some additional space between my existing red group and my images here. So I'm just going to click on my red group that sits above this. And I'm just going to add in 10 pixels of margin at the bottom, which is just going to make sure that these elements no longer touch. And from here, I'm also going to need to create a way to hide and display this yellow group with all of the images within it. So at this point in time, this group here would in fact be visible every single time this page is loaded. And that's actually not the experience I want to create. I want to only display this group with all of the additional images whenever this information icon is clicked. And so if you remember our settings page that we had previously built out, we had leveraged a custom state to understand when we were going to hide or display certain groups within that page. At this point in time, we're going to replicate the exact same thing. And so I'm going to set a custom state that's going to recognize if this group should be displayed. And if that state equals yes, I want this group to be visible. And if that state equals no, I want this group to be hidden. So I'm going to select on my overall page here, which is my gray element. So just for reference, this is my home page number one. What I'm going to do is open up the information icon here and I'm going to create a new custom state. And I'm gonna call this display additional images. And once again, I'll be setting this state type to be a yes, no option. And I'll choose to create that. By default, I'm gonna set this state to be no, because I don't want this group to be visible as soon as the page is loaded. And then of course, I'm gonna to need to create a way to update the custom state every single time this information icon is clicked. So I'm going to select my icon here, I'm gonna to jump to my appearance tab, and I'm gonna to choose to start a workflow whenever this is clicked. And within this workflow, I'm gonna type in the word state, and I'll be setting the state of an element. The element will be our overall home page. The state will be our display additional images. And in this case, I'm gonna now set the state to be yes, which means that I do want to display the list of additional images. But another thing I'd just like to point out is that we're gonna to need to build out an additional workflow that's then going to turn this state back to no. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna to choose to make a copy of this exact workflow here. I will paste this in. And whenever this element is clicked, what I'd like to do is now set the state to no. But one thing I should point out is that I only want this workflow here to run if the state is currently set to yes, because I'd like to switch it off. And so the way in which I can make sure that that's going to run correctly is by selecting on my workflow trigger here. And I'm gonna add a condition on this workflow that only allows it to run if the home page so I'm gonna select the home one. If it's display additional images custom state is currently set to yes, this workflow will run and it will then turn it to no, which means back on my first workflow here, I'm gonna to need to add a condition that's just going to only allow this to run if my home page, it's display images custom state is currently set to no. This step in our workflow would run and it would now set it to yes. And now that takes care of everything we need to build out when it comes to our custom states. If I was to jump back into my design tab here, I'm then just gonna need to create a way to hide and display our yellow group here based on what the value of our custom state currently is. So I'm going to need to select the yellow group. So I'm going to click on the repeating group that sits within it. I'm then going to right click on the repeating group and select its first parent, which is our group D, so our yellow group. 
I'm then going to head to our layout tab here. And at this point in time, this group is visible as soon as the page is loaded. I'm going to unselect that that should be true. And I'm also going to collapse this group when it's hidden. I'm then going to head over to our conditional tab here. I'm going to define a condition and I'm going to recognize when the home page, when it's display additional images, when it's custom state, it's value is yes. I would like to select that this element is visible and tick that that should be true. And now the other thing I'd like to do is create a condition on our information icon here. So if a user clicks on this information icon and it displays those images, what I'm going to do is replicate a similar experience to the real world Tinder product. And I'm going to update this icon to display a pink arrow, which just notifies a user that they can close this additional menu. And so I'm going to head to our conditional tab on this icon here. I'm going to define a new condition. Within this condition, I'm going to recognize when the home page, when it's display additional images custom state is currently set to yes. I'm going to update the icon itself. And in this case, I'm just gonna search for an arrow icon. And I'm going to select this icon here pointing down within a circle. And then I'm also going to want to update the color of this icon. As I mentioned, I have a pink color code here that I'm gonna set this to be. If you'd like that color code, it's double F5864. And now what I love about bubbles conditions is that you can also toggle these on and off to see what this is going to look like whenever this condition is true. And another thing I might do is also just update the size of this icon. So I'd like to make this a little bit bigger when our menu is down, just so it's obvious where a user needs to click in order to close that additional menu. So I'm also just going to update the width of this icon. I'll set this to be 35 pixels. And then I'll also update the height. I will also set that to be 35 pixels. And now you'll see that when this condition is true, it's just going to increase the size of that icon as well as update the color and the icon that's displayed itself. And at this point in time, we've pretty much finished building out the home page. I'm just going to display this group one last time here. The very last thing I would like to do on our home page is just build out two buttons at the bottom here which is just going to allow someone to either choose if they want to dislike or like this user. So while our Tinder pile will allow someone to either swipe left or right, if you're trying to replicate the real world Tinder product, you'll also notice that below the pile of user images, they display two big buttons. There is a red cross and a green tick, which you can also just click those buttons and it will make the decision for you. And of course, if we're rebuilding the real world Tinder product, that is an experience I'd like to replicate as well. And so in order to do that, what I'm going to do is add in yet another group below our yellow group here. And inside of that group, I'm gonna create two custom buttons. And so I'm gonna to head to my visual elements here. I'm going to add in a group element. And because I'd like to display two buttons beside each other, I'll be updating the layout style of this group to be a row which of course is where you can stack elements horizontally. I'm going to unselect that this element should be fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite, which means that this group is going to be indefinitely responsive regardless of the size of the page. I'll then jump over into my appearance tab here because for the time being, I'm just gonna remove the style of this. I will set the background style to be a flat color and I might just make this a light shade of blue so that way I can see where it sits on my page for now. And now inside of this group, as I mentioned, I'm gonna to need to create two custom buttons. And now while you can choose to add in just a regular button element, unfortunately it doesn't give you the ability to customize it by adding in custom icons. And so as I'd mentioned before, the two buttons I'm gonna to wanna to create is just a large red X and a green tick inside of two circles. One thing I will point out though, is that if you ever want to create your own custom button, you can do this by adding in a group element. And so I'm going to add yet another group inside my existing group here. And I'm going to call this group dislike. So that way I can tell when I create a workflow in the future, this is the group I'm gonna reference on my workflow trigger. And now when it comes to the actual color of this group, I'm going to remove the style here. I'm not gonna add a background color because I would in fact like this group to be transparent. 
What I am going to do, however, is update the border to be a solid border. And I'm going to update the color of this to be red. So if you'd like this color code, it's FC4141. And I'm also just going to update the width of the border to be 2. So that way I can see it clearly on my page. And then finally, I'm also going to update the roundness of this to be 100. So that way it will become a perfect circle. Then if I jump over into my layout tab here, I'm going to update the container layout to be a row. And now within this group, I'm going to only be adding in one element, which is just going to be an icon, so an X. And because I would like to have some additional controls over the container alignment of where that element's going to sit, I'm gonna set the container layout to be a row. I'm then going to update the width of this group to be 60 pixels. And I will be leaving this as a fixed width because I won't want this group to expand based on the size of the page. I'm always gonna want it to be 60 pixels by 60 pixels, which means I'm going to update the height here to also be 60 pixels. And I'll be selecting that that should be a fixed width as well. And then when it comes to the margin of this group, I'm just gonna add in five pixels of margin at the top, five at the bottom, 10 on the left and 10 on the right. And as you can see, we're starting to create almost like a button element here. Within that, I'm gonna need to add in an icon element, which will just be a cross. Ironically though, when I did some searching, I wasn't actually able to find an icon that is a cross. And so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna add in a text element that is an X, and we're just gonna make that look like an icon. So if I scroll on up to my visual elements, I'm gonna to choose to just add a text element inside of my group here. And I'm gonna make that a capital X. When it comes to the style of this, I'm just gonna remove the style here. I would like to align this text in the center of the element. And then I'd also like to update the font size to be 30. I'm also going to bold this. And then finally, I would like to update the color to be the same red color code as the group it's going to sit within, which is FC4141. If I then jump over to my layout tab here, I'm going to unselect that this element should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And then I'll also set the minimum height as zero, leaving the maximum height as infinite. And now because this text element sits within our red group, which has a container layout of a row, it's given me the additional option to update the vertical alignment to now center that within our red group. I could also then click on my red group and make sure that the horizontal alignment is centered as well, which is just going to indefinitely position that X in the center of both the vertical and horizontal space of our red group. And as you can see, that's the very first button that I'd like to add within our group. Beside this, I'd just like to add in another button, which is going to be a green button that includes a tick inside of it. And to streamline that whole process, I'm actually just gonna make a copy of our existing red group. I'm going to delete the X that sits within this, and then I'm gonna to need to update the color of our red group here to now be green. Before I do that though, I'm just going to update the name to be called group like. So that way when I create a workflow in a moment, I know which group to reference. I'll jump over into my appearance tab here because I'm gonna to want to update the color of this group to be a shade of green that I have here. If you'd like this color code, it's 35AB7C. I'm then going to add in an icon inside of this group. And thankfully there is an icon that is a tick. So I'm gonna to head to my visual elements. I'll select to add in an icon. And from memory, the icon is actually called a check. I'll select to add this in. I'll jump over to our layout tab here. And then when it comes to the size of this icon, I'm gonna make this 50 pixels by 50 pixels. I will be leaving this as a fixed height and width as well. I'm going to also vertically align this in the center of my green group, just to ensure that it is always in fact positioned in the center. I'll jump over to my appearance tab and I'm also just going to remove the style of this and I'll be updating the color to be that same shade of green as the group that it sits within. And now you can start to see that I have my two Tinder buttons here. Although of course we're gonna to need to align these in the center of our blue group. So I'm gonna click on my blue group that these elements both sit within. I'll jump to my layout tab. And within this, I'm gonna update the container alignment to be centered, which is now going to position those right in the center. I'll also then update the minimum height to be zero. And because we have this option ticked here to fit the height of the element to the content within it, 
it's going to collapse around that nicely. And then finally, I'd just like to add in some margins on both of the sides of this group. So I'm gonna add in 10 pixels of margin on the left, 10 on the right, and 20 at the bottom. And just like that, that is in fact everything I would like to add onto my home page. I know at this point in time, it looks a little strange just because we have so many different groups and colors, but if you were to update these to all be the same color, it would look a bit more consistent. What I'd love to do though is to show you how this home page is going to function by displaying some user profiles within our Tinder pile. But before I do that, I'm gonna need to obviously register some additional accounts just so that way I have some additional users to display. One thing I will point out is that if you want to preview your application and let's say you create a user's account, you should just remember that we obviously have a very specific search algorithm added onto our Tinder pile here, which is going to determine which users are going to be displayed. So before I normally preview my app, what I'll do is I'll open up my data search here and I'll sometimes just remove the location parameter as well as any of the other parameters just to ensure that I can at least see someone on my Tinder pile just because it'll save me having to go through and create very specific accounts that meet all of my users' preferences. I'd also just like to point out that, of course, if you make a change here, you can always revert it, and you'll also just need to make that same change across each of your conditions here. So every single time you perform a different search based on a user's sexual interests, you're just going to need to remove the same thing. What I am going to do though now is just log in as my Lachlan Kirkwood account and I'll show you how a, another user is going to be displayed within my Tinder pile. Over in a preview of my app here, I'm just going to reduce the size of my browser so that way it looks more like a mobile device. And what you'll see here is that I have an image being displayed of a person with an account. Of course, below that, it displays their information, like their name, their age, as well as their job title. If I wanted to view all of their additional images within their account, I could select our information icon, and these images are going to be loaded, which I could scroll across and view all of those if I'd like. I could even choose to close that group if I'm content with seeing all of those images. And of course, at this point in time, I will have the ability to swipe left or right on this particular user. And what you'll see is that if I was to do that, there is another user who would be displayed. One thing I would like to point out is that although we are able to swipe left and right on users, at this point in time, we haven't yet built out the workflows to make any changes in our database. So by swiping left or right, it won't actually do anything at this point in time. The other thing I should note is that if I was to show you a preview of how this page is going to look and behave on a mobile device, what you'll see is that it actually looks a bit neater just because the borders are a bit closer to the actual Tinder pile itself. And of course, if I wanted to open up my information icon here, I could see a list of all of this user's additional photos, as well as being able to close that. And of course, I could swipe left or right on this user as well. Back in my Notion doc, I'm going to tick off that we've finished building out the first step of our free version of the homepage for our Tinder clone. And within that, I explained how we could add our Tinder pile plugin as well as create a couple of different search algorithms to determine which users would be displayed for a person's profile. And then finally, I'd also explained how we could use a group and a custom state to display a list of all of the additional images someone has saved within their Tinder account. As we start to finish off the home page for the first plugin that I'm building our Tinder clone with today, there's just one last key feature I'd like to create on this. And that of course is the workflows that are going to allow us to either like or dislike someone by swiping left or right, as well as then create a match in our database and display to a user that they have in fact received a new match. And this is a relatively straightforward process in my opinion. However, of course, I will be sure to explain everything you need to know in as much detail as possible as we walk through all of the steps. So for now, I'm going to open up my bubble editor here. And the very first thing I'm going to do is build out the workflow that runs every single time someone swipes left on a user, which means that they're disliking that person. So they wanna add it to their list of people that they have passed on. 
And so in order to do that, you might remember from my demo before when I had shown you our homepage, the Tinder pile allows us to swipe left or right. What I'm going to do is jump into my workflow editor here and we're going to build a workflow from scratch. And if we head to our element triggers here, what you'll see is that we have the ability to trigger a workflow whenever the Tinder pile card is swiped right or it's swiped left. And in this case, I'm going to create a workflow every single time the Tinder pile is swiped left. And within this workflow, it's a relatively straightforward process. What I'm going to do is add the person who is being displayed on our Tinder pile to the list of users that the current person who's swiping left on this person has added to their dislike pile. So I'm going to head to my data tab here and I'm going to make changes to a thing. The thing I would like to change is going to be the current user. And in this case, what I'm going to do is change the disliked users, which is a list of users in our database. And in this instance, I just want to add to that list the Tinder pile user. So that is the person who's being displayed on the current slide. And now because within this workflow, we are disliking a particular user, I'm going to open up the workflow trigger here and update the event color to be red. So I can see that this is a workflow when someone is being disliked. What I'm then going to do is jump back into my design tab here. And you might remember that we had added in these two separate buttons as alternatives for swiping actions. What I'm going to do is click on the overall circle group that my X text sits within. So this is my group dislike. And I'm pretty much going to create the exact same workflow I've just done there. So every single time this group is clicked, it's going to act as a button. And within this workflow, I'm just going to replicate the exact same step that I had just done. So I'm going to open up my data tab. I'll choose to make changes to a thing. The thing I would like to change is the current user. And in this instance, I'd like to update their disliked users list. And I want to add to that the Tinder pile user, the person who's being displayed within the current slide. Like before, I'm also then just going to open up my workflow trigger and I'll update the event color here to be red. So that way I can see this is a workflow related to disliking someone. Now from here, what I'd like to do is build out my alternative workflow that allows us to actually like a user if someone swipes right on them. And if the other person who someone just swiped right on has also liked the current user, I would like to create a new match in my database and then display an alert through a pop-up to this particular user. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a brand new workflow from scratch once again. I'm going to head to my element triggers here and I'll select when the Tinder's pile card is swiped right. In this case, what I would like to do is make a couple of different changes. And the first is that I would like to add the person who's being displayed within the Tinder pile to the current users list of liked users. So I'm going to add a step here. I'll head to our data tab and I'd like to make changes to a thing. Similar to before, the thing I'd like to change is the current user. Only in this case, I'd like to update their list of liked users. And I want to add to that, once again, the Tinder pile user, the current slide. And that is how we can add someone to a list of their liked users. But what happens if someone swipes right on someone who has prior to this also swiped right on them? In that case, we would need to create a new match within our database. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an additional step on my workflow here that's only going to run if the person who is being displayed on our Tinder pile, if they have already liked the current user who is now swiping right on that person, I want to create a match in my database with these two users. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to head to my data tab here and I'm going to create a new thing because I want to create a new match. So for the type of thing I want to create, as I mentioned, I want to create a new match in my database. I'd also just like to add a condition on this step here to only allow this step in our workflow to run if the person who has just been added to the user's list of liked users. If that person in the past has already liked the current user, I will want this step in our workflow to also run. So I'm going to create a condition and recognize that if the Tinder pile user, if the person being displayed on the current slide, if their list of liked users already does contain 
the current user, I would like this step in our workflow to run, which means that because this person has already liked the person who's logged in, swiping right, this workflow will now run and create a successful match in our database. And when it comes to the fields I'll need to store within our new match, I'm essentially just gonna to want to add both of these users into this match. So I'm going to recognize that the all matched users field, which if you remember in our database is stored as a list of users, I would like to add to it the Tinder Pile's current user. So the Tinder Pile user, the current slide. So that is the person who's being displayed on our page through the Tinder Pile element. And then finally, I'm gonna need to also add to this match the current user, which is the person who has just swiped right and completed this match. So I'm going to once again select that the all matched users field. I would also like to add to it the current user. It's as simple as that. And that's how we can now create a chat within our database. But what I'd like to do is now, similar to the real world Tinder product, create a pop-up that's displayed over my page that just notifies the user that they have successfully matched with this person. And it can also prompt them to send a message to this person if they would like. And so in order to build that out within our workflow, I'm first gonna to need to actually design that pop-up on my page. So if I head over to my design tab here, what I'd like to do is just scroll on down to my containers menu and I'd like to add a pop-up element. Now at this point in our tutorial, we haven't yet used a pop-up, but these are pretty self-explanatory. It's going to temporarily display almost like a group over the top of your page. And it will also just add a layer of opacity over the rest of the page. So that way the main focus is on this pop-up itself. And when it comes to the content I would like to display on this pop-up, I want to essentially send through the value of the new match that's been created in our database to the pop-up. So that way I can easily reference which particular user's information I'd like to display on that pop-up. And so if I jump over into my design tab, what you might notice is that within the pop-up element, you have the ability to store a data type on this. And in this case, because I'd like to send it through some data of a match, I'm going to set the type of content here to be a match, which will just allow me to then store a data value within the pop-up that I can then reference to display that information on elements inside of it. One thing I will point out is that I won't need to set a data source here. I'm actually gonna send through a data source in my workflow in a moment. So I'll be sure to explain that in more detail when I get there. What I'd like to do before I build out that workflow though is just actually edit the style and information I'm gonna be displaying on this pop-up itself. And so what I'm going to do is just remove the style of this pop-up here. I'm then going to just remove the background color to be none. And so at this point, you shouldn't actually be able to see the pop-up, it should be clear. I'm then also going to update the border of this to be solid. And I'm going to set the border to be five. And I'll also update the color of the border to be white. So that way I can see where it sits on my page. And now the reason why I have not added a solid color as the background is because if you're familiar with the real world Tinder product, when you match with a user, it displays a pop-up and the background image of that pop-up is the person's profile photo that you've just matched with. And that's something that we're going to replicate within our build today. So if I was to scroll on up here to the background style, I'm now going to actually update this to be an image. And that's going to now open this field here where I can display a dynamic image. And as I mentioned within our workflow here, we had created a match. The next step I'm going to add into my workflow is that I'm going to send the data of this match through to that pop-up which means that I can reference both of the users who are involved with this particular match. And in this case, I want to display the profile photo of the person who is not the current user because the current user is the person who's just swiped right on someone. And if that user who they swiped right on has also liked them in the past, they have just created a new match, which means I want to display the profile photo of the first person who swiped right within this match. And so in order to display that particular user, not the current user, I'm going to insert dynamic data and I'm going to display the pop-up match 
Now the pop-up match is the pop-up itself that we are working on and it's referred to as pop-up match because we had set the type of content to be a match. I'm then going to reference the match that is stored within this pop-up, all of the users within that particular match. And now of course, by default, we're gonna be storing two users within this match. Whereas I'm only gonna to want to display the profile photo of one user. And that user is the person who is not the current user. And so in order to only display the person's image who is not the current user, I'm gonna type in the word minus here. And you'll see that I have the option to minus an item. And the reason that I have the option to minus an item is because the matched users within this chat is a list of users. So I can now subtract from that one particular user if I would like. And the user I would like to subtract is in fact the current user, which means that it's now going to display the person who had created the first like within this match. And in this instance, I would like to display that person's profile photo. So I'm going to select on the each item's profile photo choice. And now that will display the picture of the person that someone has just matched with. I'm also then just going to want to update the layout settings of this pop-up before I add in the relevant elements inside of it. So I'm going to jump to my layout tab here and for the container layout, I'm going to set this as a column because I'd like to stack elements in this from top to bottom. When it comes to the width of this pop-up, there's a couple of different choices in how you can edit this. I personally am going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width as zero and leave the maximum width as 380. And the reason why I've selected 380 is because that is the width of our mobile device here. If you wanted this pop-up to be fully responsive across, let's say something like a desktop device, you could just set the max width as infinite. But what you'll see is if I open up my responsive tab here, that pop-up is always going to remain the exact same size, which is the experience that I personally prefer. I'm also just going to leave the minimum height as it is for now, but I can come back and edit that later on once I've finished adding all of the elements I want within this pop-up. But when it comes to this pop-up, I'm just going to now display a text element across this that just says that someone has found a new match. And then below that, I'm going to have an input field which will prompt someone to send a message to that user. And so I'm going to head to my visual elements here and I'm going to add a text element into my pop-up. And when it comes to this text, I'm just going to type in the words, it's a match followed by an explanation mark, just because that is the same text that Tinder uses within their real world product. I'm then going to remove the style of this and I'd like to update the font size to be 50. And then I'm going to set the color to be a shade of green that I have here. If you'd like that color code, it's 35AB7C. I'm also then just going to choose to bold this text here and then I'm going to jump into my layout tab because I'd like to update the responsive settings of this text. I'm going to like always unselect that this should be fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum height as infinite. I'll set the minimum height as zero, making sure I've selected the option to fit this element's height to the content within it. And then finally, I'm going to add in a hundred pixels of margin at the top. And I can also see I'm going to need to align this text in the center of the element. So I'll jump back over to my appearance tab here and choose to align that in the center. And then finally below this text element, I'm going to add in an input field next to a send button, which will prompt this user to send a message to this person that they've just matched with. And because I'd like to add two elements side by side, I'm going to need to add in a group that has the container layout of a row. So I'm going to scroll on down to my containers menu. I'll choose to add a group into my pop-up here. I'm going to remove the style of this group, set the background color as a flat color, and then I will update the roundness of this group to be five. I'm going to jump into my layout tab here because I'll need to update the container layout to be a row. And then for the width, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And I'll be coming back in a moment to update the height and the margins of this particular group. But inside of this group, as I'd mentioned, I want to display an input field followed by some text that's going to act as a button. And so I'm going to scroll on down to my input forms here. 
I'm going to add in a regular input field and I'm going to call this field new match message. And this of course is going to be the input field that will allow someone to send a message to someone. I'm going to jump to my layout tab. I will update the responsive settings by unselecting that this should be fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And I'm also just gonna keep this as a fixed height, just at 45 pixels, just because I'm always gonna want it to just be 45 pixels. And if I was going to replicate the real world Tinder product, I'm also just gonna jump into my appearance tab and update the placeholder text that's displayed within this input field. I'm going to have this say the words, say something nice, which will prompt someone to send a message. And now beside this input field, I just like to add a text element that's going to function like a button. So when that text element is clicked, it's going to actually send this message to that user within this match. And so I'm gonna scroll on up and add a text element into my group here. And when it comes to the text I'd like to display, I'm just gonna say the word send. I'm going to then remove the style of this element because I'd like to update the color of this to be a shade of blue here. If you want that color code, it's double four six double F C. I'm also just gonna to choose to bold this text here. And then I'm gonna jump into my layout tab because I'd like to update the width of this element. I'm gonna have this be 40 pixels in width and I will be keeping this a fixed width. The reason for that is because I don't want this element to take up half of my group. I only need enough space to display the actual word itself. And then I'm gonna want the remainder of the space to be allocated to the input field beside it. I'm also then just going to set the minimum height as zero. So that way it collapses around the text. And I'll also want this element to be centered in the very center of my white group. So I'm gonna click on the text element and vertically align that in the center. I'll then move it to the next position within my group. So that way it sits on the right hand side. And then finally, I'm gonna select on my input field here because I'd also like to vertically align that in the center. And now you can start to see that all of my elements are coming together nicely within this overall group. And so what I'm going to do is click on the overall white group itself. I'm going to set the minimum height of this to be zero. Only I'm also going to add in some margins. I'm going to add a top margin of 200 pixels, a bottom margin of 50, and then both a left and right side margin of 20 each. And now you'll see that this group is positioned quite nicely within my overall pop-up. And I'm not gonna actually build out the functionality for this message experience just yet. We will come back at a later point in time and make this functional. What I would like to focus on doing right now though is just building out the rest of our workflow that's going to display the match within this pop-up. So if I jump over into my workflow editor and open the workflow where we had created a new match, what I'd like to do is create an additional step within this workflow where I want to send the data of this new match through to our pop-up. And so in order to do that, I'm gonna add a new step here. I'm gonna scroll on down to my element actions and I'm gonna to choose to display some data in a group. The element I want to display data into is gonna be our pop-up match, which is the new pop-up we just created. And the data I would like to send through is gonna be the new match that we've also just created, which is gonna be a result of step two in our workflow, because it was the second step where we had in fact created a match. One thing I will need to do is also create the same condition that was on our step two of our workflow here. So I only want this event to run if a match has in fact been created. And the only way to create a match is of course by identifying if the person who's just been liked has also liked the current user in the past. So I'm gonna click on our step three here and I'm only going to allow this to run if the current Tinder pile, so the Tinder pile user, if it's current slide, if their list of liked users contains the current user, I will allow this to run. And then finally, after I've sent data through to that pop-up, I'm gonna need to add one last step that's actually going to allow me to display this pop-up. So once again, I'm going to add an additional step. I'll head to my element actions here. And at the very top, you'll see the option to show an element. And the element I would like to show is now my pop-up. And of course, I'm only gonna want this to run when a match has been successfully created. 
So I'm going to add the same condition as before, and I'm going to recognize if our Tinder pile user, if the person in the current slide, if their list of like users already does contain the current user, that step in our workflow will run, and it will now display our pop-up. And that is everything we'll need to build out within our workflow to not only just like a user, but also create a match if a like is being reciprocated. What I'd like to do is click on my workflow trigger here and I want to update the event color to be green. So that way I know this workflow is going to run whenever someone likes a user. The very last thing I want to do on this page is just build out a workflow that's going to run whenever our like button is being clicked here. So I'm going to click on the overall green circle group. I'll choose to start a workflow every single time this element is clicked. And in order to streamline the whole process of rebuilding the exact same workflow from scratch, I'm just going to copy and paste across all of those workflow steps. Before I do that though, I'm just going to update the event color here to be green. So that way I can see that this is also my like workflow event. I'll then open up my existing like workflow. I'm going to right click on each of the steps. I'll copy this. I'll then paste this in. I'll just need to make sure that everything here is valid, which it is. I'll then jump back to my original workflow. I'll copy the second step. I'll jump back to my new one and paste that in. And once again, it has been copied across successfully. I'll then copy across the third step. I will paste that in. And at this point in time, I'll just need to reconfigure this step here. So the data I want to display in my pop-up is once again, result of step two in my workflow. And then finally, I'm going to copy the very last step and I will paste this in as well. And I can see that I don't have any errors there. So that is now complete. What I'd like to do is now just show you a quick preview of how this is going to function when we like or dislike a user within our Tinder product. And before I show you a preview, I'm gonna log in as one of my other accounts and make sure that I've already liked my Lachlan Kirkwood account. So that way when I swipe right on that user, it's going to create a new match within our database and then display our pop-up on the home page. Over in a preview of my app here on my mobile device, you can see that I'm going to start by swiping left on this user to add them to my dislike pile. But let's say if I wanted to swipe right on this user, what you'll see is that it's going to create a match with this user because they have already swiped right on myself. And now you'll see that our match has been created in our database and our pop-up is now being displayed and it's now showing that person's profile photo within my pop-up itself. And of course, later on, when we build out the experience to send a message to this user through this pop-up, it will be completely functional. But for the time being, I just wanted to highlight how we could create a match and then show that successfully within our application. If I was to jump back in to my Notion doc here, I'm going to check off that we've finished building out the feature to create a new match within our database with our first Tinder plugin. Now, when it comes to the process of creating a match with our second plugin, which is the paid version, the whole process is gonna be much the same. So thankfully that whole process won't be as timely again. We can just copy and paste certain aspects of the existing workflows that we've just set up. And that is all I have time to include within our YouTube tutorial today. As you can see, even after hours of building, we've barely scratched the surface on what's possible throughout our Tinder build. We're still yet to create features like building out the messaging experience between users, which includes things like unread message notifications, and even the ability to view a full profile preview of someone's account. And so if you'd like to get access to the rest of the course, I'd suggest hitting the link in the description below so you can get full access. Within that, there's hours of additional content that will help you build out the rest of your Tinder MVP. For now though, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to watch up to this point in our tutorial. If you'd like to stay up to date with any additional bubble tutorials I release, I'd recommend hitting the subscribe button on my channel, so that way you're the first to know when I release new content. But for now, I wish you all of the best on your own no-code journey.